Good afternoon. The US healthcare system is sick. We've had generations of improving life expectancy and improving health span. Uh, but if you look at the last 20 years leading up to COVID, uh, we've had almost nothing out of it. If you look at that health adjusted life expectancy curve there, we've gained 20 weeks in 20 years. And since 2014, we've been in decline. This graph is health spending in the US per capita adjusted for inflation. And you can see we're on this linear pathway. In that same period where we gained 20 weeks, we roughly doubled the amount per person we spent on healthcare after adjusting for inflation. So where's all the money going? Um, you may have seen this famous graph from Himmelstein and Wolhander that looked at uh, census data on jobs. And they found that over 40 years, there are three times as many physicians, but 32 times as many healthcare administrators. And more than a 10 to one uh, growth ratio there. And we know from time and motion studies, if you run the math on this, that physicians are now spending more time on record keeping than they are on clinical work. Um, and so I'm not saying that Record keeping is the only problem with the healthcare system or the only thing driving these, but it's a big fish to fry. And so maybe we can solve it using some AI. So many of us since November 30th with launch have tried ChatGPT out. Uh, and you can see how it does on clinical tasks. Here I am, I'm gonna ask it to write a denial of coverage uh, letter for a patient with chronic kidney disease. And it does a pretty passable job. And I only had to speed this video up a little bit for the talk. Um, and this has already sort of been weaponized uh, by a group who has something called DocsGPT at Doximity. So DocsGPT has a list of pre-built cases relevant to clinical practice. And you can go in, customize what you need. There we go, there's my letter. Uh, I can then select the insurer I wanna fax it to uh, and click the button to do a HIPAA compliant fax to that insurance company. Facts, exactly. So let's back up a bit and think about what would happen if we scaled this up. What actually happened there in DocsGPT? Well, there was a doctor. They knew they needed something. So they wrote a prompt for an AI. Then the AI thought about it for a bit uh, and it wrote up some formal language. That formal language, the doctor tweaked it, maybe put in the patient's name. Uh, then it got turned into an image, a picture of the words. And then that picture of the words got sent to probably a printer driver pretending to be a fax machine that then you know, pretended to have a phone line, probably using the direct protocol that connected to another fax fax machine over at the insurance company, uh, which then has the image of those words. It runs optical character recognition on them so it can see what those characters were uh, to get back that formal language. And then a human, uh, or maybe an AI, reads that language and says, ah, this is what the doctor wanted, and goes and types it into a database so that somebody else can process it. So I would submit to you that only the doctor and the database are actually doing anything of value for the health system. <laughs> if you look below, all of this stuff is waste. And not only is it waste, it's old tech on top of old tech. It's like we took apart a jet engine and inside was a car engine, and inside the car engine was a bicycle, and then inside of that, the horse was riding the bike. Like, <laughs> this is a crazy way to build systems. Um, and this is part of the reason why the healthcare system is sick. We have this bureaucratic plaque in the arteries of the system. Or, if you prefer the language of software development, we have technical debt um, that we need to pay off. And one of my concerns is if we just naively apply generative AI like ChatGPT to the health system, we're gonna be making interest-only payments on that debt uh, and growing the principal and just kicking the can further down. So, is generative AI a uh, dead end in medicine? I'm gonna say yes and save Daniel 10 minutes on the schedule. <laughs> At least in this way. Um, the lowest hanging fruit is a bit rotten. It doubles down on the past and it perpetuates the mistakes we've made before. So I think there is a future for generative AI in medicine. Uh, but I want to unpack a little bit about how it works so we can understand how to use it correctly. And Siraj mentioned a program called ELISA, which was one of the first chatbots in the 1960s. Um, and so that's been around forever. ChatGPT is just another chatbot. What's so special about it? Well, I would submit it's the convergence of four innovations in one package. You have a process called attention, uh, some variation in how it responds, some pre-training that no means it knows what to talk about, and then an overall architecture that wraps it together. 
Attention is this really nerdy term. Uh, it comes from this paper uh, from 2017 in Google. Uh, and I'm not going to explain how it works because, frankly, it's really complicated. But what it is, is it's a way to handle sequences of data. So when you have a sentence, uh, you have a sequence of words. And the meaning of the words depends not just on the word itself, but its position in the sentence and the context of other words. And what attention does is a much, much better job than previous generations at getting this correct so that it can actually understand meaning. And this is very important for language tasks because with language, context is king. This is a graph uh, from a paper here where you're seeing which words the AI looked at to understand what the pronoun it meant. Um, if you just have it by itself, it doesn't mean anything. To understand the rest of this, I'm going to use this hyper-simplified model of how ChatGPT works. And I'm going to break it out into components, but I want you to know the reality is these components are really tightly interleaved, and you can't nicely separate them like this in real life. Um, but the basic task that all these models do is you give it some input, some words, and it tries to guess a statistically likely set of words that follows. So how does it do that? Well, first, it starts with your prompt. It breaks it up into things called tokens. Uh, tokens aren't exactly words, but think of them as words. They're the computer's idea of words. Then there's this thing called the encoder. And what the encoder does is it turns those tokens, that English, and it says, ah, it's this concept in this high dimensional vector space. Now, what the heck does that mean? Uh, so basically, it turns your, con your concept into something that is encoded and it can do mathematics with. So if you have the concept for queen, subtract woman, add man, you'll get king. Uh, and so this is how it understands the relationships between words and concepts. Uh, and if you search around King to see sort of what is like it, uh, if it's been trained in English, you'll probably find Prince and Duke because of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, who was the Queen's husband and a lot of ink has been spilled about him. This search-ish process is actually kind of what search engines do now. It tries to figure out the concept of your search and it looks around for results and then gives you a list of them. With the chatbot, you just want to give one result. You don't want to give a list of possible options. So which result do you pick? Do you always pick the top one? Well, you can if you want to. Um, this is, again, from OpenAI. This is the internals of GPT. Um, and it has this parameter called temperature, which is the amount of variation, the amount of randomness in that search. And if you set it to zero, you get a really boring textbooky answer. But if you crank it up, and ask the same question, then we suddenly get chronic kidney diseases like a broken car. It gives you an analogy instead of just a definition uh, because now it's broadened its search. It's doing a, a things at a little more variance. After the computer looks at this, it decides, okay, this is what I want to see next, based on, say next, based on this uh, search process. I'll feed it to a decoder, turns it back into words. Those words get shuffled around so that it makes reasonable English, um, which is another trick of attention. All of this works because the entire system has been pre-trained on the English language. And this is a big revolution for uh, machine learning. Before, it was like you had a baby that knew nothing and you had to teach it everything in order to do anything. Now you have these foundational models that have gone to basic school. They understand the English language, the relationship between words, how the concepts touch upon each other. Uh, and this means this is really going to speed up the machine learning operation cycle. If you've ever done this, this is just gasoline on it. It's going to go faster, there's going to be less time labeling, and you're going to have a faster turnaround uh, of your process. So this fundamental architecture is kind of what a general AI looks like. And we call this sequence to sequence. A sequence goes in, a statistically likely sequence that follows comes out. Uh, and ChatGPT is what we call a text to text uh, model, because text goes in, text comes out. So what can you do with text? Uh, well, you can take something simple uh, and you can expand on it. So here I am asking it for aftercare instructions for a surgery. I gave it a few pointers, but it's filling in all the common sense stuff by itself. P potentially saves quite a bit of effort. You can ask it to summarize. Here I'm going to ask it to summarize um, and tell me what the record retention requirements are from FDA's Part 820 quality system regulation. And it does a very passable job of reading that regulation, understanding what it means, and telling me. You can use it to improve language as an editor. Uh, one thing these AIs are amazing at is style transfer. You can say, in the style of. And so here's chronic kidney disease in the style of Shakespeare versus Flava Flav, depending on how you want to see it. <laughs> Uh, you could change languages, uh, explain it in French, and it gave me back this very passable French, um, and, which, by the way, is quite remarkable for a model that was, in theory, trained exclusively on English. <laughs> but text-to-text, -text, that's really just the tip of the iceberg. 
When you dig in, you can actually do any sequence to any other sequence, provided there's a causal relationship between the two of them. So let's look at text to image. Um, so this is, at, on the left, I asked Midjourney, give me a woman undergoing kidney dialysis. And it drew these four pictures for me from its imagination. Uh, that top right image there, that's not a photograph. That's just how the, the AI stable diff diffusion responded when I said mullet. And then I said mullet in the style of a car, and it gave me a car that's all fun in the back and all business in the front, um, which was pretty remarkable. Understood the mulletness of a mullet. Um, you can think about, you know, image to image. Here's a painting. Uh, I went into Dali, which is another open AI uh, project, and I cut out this area in the bottom and I said, hey, it's a painting on the wall that includes a border collie. And it drew this. It put in the right kind of dog at the right scale with the right lighting in the right style, uh, and it fits in with the painting. So that's quite impressive. Uh, this may not be as impressive to some of you as it is to me, but this is code to code. So here I am, I'm writing some code, and every now and then you'll see some gray text pop up. That is the AI from GitHub's Copilot suggesting what comes next. And this is like pair programming with another person. It just goes so much faster. GitHub's internal research says it about doubles the output of their programmers. You can do text to uh, objects. This one's called pointy. I said make a purple snowman. There you go, there's a point cloud of a purple snowman. You could feed this to a 3D printer, you could take it into a character creator software, and away you go. There, you can even use this for chemistry. Um, so this is a little bit of an older technology, but it's still a generative AI uh, called Megasyn, and it tries to predict the bioactivity of molecules and optimize for drug discovery. And this one's particularly interesting and famous because the authors and the creators of it did an experiment. Usually the model um, rewards activity and penalizes toxicity, and they decided to flip the bit. Reward toxicity and reward bioactivity. And they let it run for six hours, and it generated about 40,000 molecules, one of which was VX nerve gas, several other known chemical warfare agents, and about 1,000 molecules that it believes would be more deadly than VX gas. So this should give us a moment of pause. This stuff works. It's very powerful, and anything powerful needs good ethical controls around it. So where does all this go in the future? Uh, first of all, we have to automate record keeping. Uh, we can't have physicians spending all their time writing records. Um, <laughs> this is super important. <laughs> that chart I drew, doctor database. Just put one little AI in there to take the doctor's speech and put it in the database. We don't need to go through all this stuff. Um, we need to automate ritualized communications. Right now you have the call center where you call in, you get put on hold, you get frustrated, you hang up, you call back later. Um, we could replace this with a conversational system to make the interface to any complicated system just plain language for people. We need to do personalization at scale. Have every patient or every physician come in with all of their needs understood and baked into their journey, their comorbidities for their aftercare instructions, their staffing schedule for, for how their assignments work. All this can be done. If you're a researcher, this is a very powerful tool. This works by finding connections between ideas. Um, so it'll find connections that no one has seen before or just connections you haven't seen before. Uh, and either way, very helpful. Uh, it democratizes creation. I have literally no artistic skill, but I can make that with Midjourney <laughs> to illustrate my idea. If you're not a coder, it can help you write running code. Uh, this is going to be the interface of programming interface of the future. You just talk to the computer, we'll get rid of the programmer. Describe what you need and it'll show up. Making interactive virtual reality uh, is a really exciting place for both for gaming and also for therapy. Imagine exposure therapy where you describe your, your trauma and it creates the correct environment for you to re-experience it safely. But I think the really powerful things that will come are going to be future sequences. Imagine a CT scan sequence or an ultrasound that gets turned into instructions for a 3D printed implant automatically. Imagine you know, signals coming from various leads within the cardiovascular system turning into a customized um, corrective signal that gets sent back out to the different parts of the heart in real time instead of just a shock. Imagine taking uh, the start of a genome saying, hey, I want these genes and doing that text continuation thing I just showed, but with genomes and having it fill out the rest of the organism. And by the way, the databases for this are already being built. Uh, GIS Aid now has 15 million COVID-19 sequences in a single database. So the training data for this is starting to be created today. Imagine you know, having a chemical saying, hey, I need to manufacture this. Could you please create an organism that, uh, that excretes it so I can put it in my bioreactor? 
You can see these technologies really can be game changers. And I think the biggest one we have is the one we haven't thought about yet. There's going to be something. So I want to talk a little bit about limitations as well. This is a very powerful approach, but it doesn't do everything. It's kind of like search on steroids. It's predicting, predicting statistically likely continuations of whatever you give it. Um, and how does it decide what's statistically likely? Well, there's no such thing as a free lunch. All of these ideas that it has comes from either the input or the pre-training. And it has all the same sort of biases and problems search has. Uh, it's been trained on scrapes of the web. Uh, so it tends to tilt towards the weight of the discussion instead of the weight of the evidence. It doesn't know how to evaluate these statements. It's going to pick up all the same human biases, mistakes, and misinformation that real humans do out on the internet. Um, and we have to be careful about disinformation. Wikipedia, for example, is a key training source. Are there going to be attacks against Wikipedia to put in false ideas to try to poison the next generation of AIs? Are people going to use these AIs to, try to perpetuate ideas into future training? The war for truth is going to get a little messy. The other thing I will say is, this sort of comprehension of the concepts plus the variation looks like cognition. To you and I who are used to evaluating intelligence by language, it looks pretty good. Uh, but it's faking it, right? This is not cognition. What you're seeing next is the statistically likely next set of words. It's not reasoning. It's not creating brand new ideas. It has no ethics or morality, although some of the developers have put a layer of that on top to try to prevent things from going wrong. And it's not a root source of innovation. There's no genuinely new ideas coming out of it. It's just a tool for linking concepts, and a really good one. So I want you to think back to the two sort of uh, disasters we have to avoid. Uh, we don't want to create chemical weapons, <laughs> and we don't want to continue perpetuating the nonsense that's already in our healthcare system. So I would say to everyone here in this room, this future we're talking about, the exponential future we all want, it's not inevitable. We have to consciously create it. So I think what we need is a Hippocratic Oath for health tech. First, do no harm. And second, pay down that technical debt. The people here are all innovators. As you go out and apply them, apply them wisely. Think beyond the obvious. Try to clear some plaque out of those arteries in the health system and leave it a bit better than you found it. And with that, I'll say thank you. And if you want to try anything out, we have a page of <laughs> examples. Thank you, Rafa. That was an amazing overview and a uh, taste of what's here and what's coming. Um, rumor has it ChatGPT4 is coming out in the next mm. week or two. I was at a meeting last week with the head of research and AI from Microsoft and their Prometheus platform, and its power is pretty trippy. Right now, it can pass about 65% of the boards, and they can do 95%. Yep. So if we're going to go to what's next, five or 10 years out, just let's say for healthcare education, what might implications would you have for this next oh, net I, audience? I think it would be incredible what we can do. I mean, um, in terms of health education, Education, we're going to have to rethink how we do examinations. I think you may see the return of the oral exam, uh, where you actually talk to the student and have them present. Um, but in terms of the actual education, imagine creating a virtual patient, an avatar that's going to react to um, what happens in the, in the clini clinical setting in a realistic way, whether it's your bedside manner or your medical technique. Right. And I think that would be a, a big benefit for medical ed. And for each of us to engage with our own health data continuously, we'll have our own chat GPT-5 sourcing and answering questions without having to go to the clinician. So. Yeah, well, maybe someday. Exciting times. Thanks, Thanks Alfred. Thank you. Thanks.